Well, good morning, Valley. It's good to be back here with you folks again. Boy, as I look around uh, at these empty chairs, I know exactly where each one of you sit, and I could just name you off right now. But uh, we're looking forward to being uh, with you uh, this morning and also at the church for those that could make it there. We attended church just a month ago up in Nampa, Idaho. We went up there to go to our grandson's graduation. And um, well, while we were on the road going up there, our son from Berkeley, he uh, texted us. He says, I don't think it's a good idea for you to go to church. And we said, well, we're going we're gonna to go. We know that there's some risk involved, but uh, we think we should go there to be with our grandkids and see them grow up. And, and uh, see them graduate. And my son countered, he said, uh, he says, he says, if you get the virus, he says, you may not. And I want you to see the grandkids grow up too. So uh, that kind of uh, reminded me that we have to weigh the, whis the risks in just about everything we do. And so that's the title of my message today, Keeping Perspective in Unsettled Times. Now, interestingly enough, when I was interacting with my son, I was reminded of a verse of scripture over in Psalm 18:2, And it says there, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my savior, my God is my rock in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me and my place of safety. And I was looking at that verse and I thought, you know, where is my protection? Well, it's in the Lord. He is my shield and he is my safety. That's all found there in Psalm 18 too. So that's a great verse you can use during this pandemic. Now, that's not to say that we throw our masks away. God gave us a brain and he wants us to use it. Oliver Cromwell back in 1642 said, put your trust in God, my boys, but keep mind to keep your powder dry. <laughs> so put your trust in God, but keep your gunpowder dry. We have to trust God, but we have to use common sense and take responsibility for our protection. You know, there's a lot of danger even just in driving down the road in a car. But uh, you use common sense and you take responsibility and you stay alert. Now, we don't want to attempt fate. In fact, uh, that was one of Satan's temptations, wasn't it? Uh, to the Lord, and he actually used scripture. Uh, Satan said, um, he said, it says over there in Psalm 91, throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple and the angels will catch you. Well, Jesus said, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. So if he's given you a brain, use it. Weigh the risks and use common sense. But uh, as I was thinking about you know, my studies for today, I was meditating in the book of Romans, and since I knew I was gonna be speaking here, I was reading through the book and meditating, and, I, and, and some verses in chapter 18 just really jumped out at me. And one of those verses was the one verse, uh, uh, chapter 18, verse eight, or chapter eight, verse 18, it says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory which he will reveal to us later. What we suffer now, and I think about all the things that we're suffering right now. And so I thought, well, I'm going to look at this passage. I'm going to read it. I'm going to study it. And as I did, I came up with really this whole study on keeping perspective in unsettled times. It goes on and it says, for all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we ourselves as believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. 
We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including new bodies that he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it, but we look forward to something we don't yet have. We must wait patiently and confidently, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us uh, believers in harmony with God's own will. And then verse 28, you know Romans 8, 28, says we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. There's Romans 8, 18 through 28. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this passage of scripture that speaks to us about uh, how we can respond, how we can live in unsettled times. We pray for Pastor Sean as he uh, is ministering up in Oregon uh, this week. We pray, Lord, that you would bless he and his family, keep them safe, give them traveling mercies up and back. We pray that it'd be a very special time for all of them and that Pastor Sean's ministry would really connect with those in their time of need. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, the underlying theme of Romans chapter 8 is triumphant living. And that's how God wants all of us to live. And Paul is really telling us here that it's desirable and it's attainable. First, because we have the Holy Spirit living within us. Secondly, because we're members of God's forever family, and he brings those things out in the first 17 verses. But third, in our verses today, because we have God, we have the Lord to go with us through our trials and be with us in our world of crisis. And so we're going to look at those verses today. And I've got uh, an outline, and in the outline, the first point is we need to, first of all, according to verse 18, Put the crisis into perspective. This is what it says. It says, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. So there's the now and there's the future. And he says, basically, put yourselves, you know, put the crisis in perspective. And Paul's challenge is for us to have an eternal perspective. Look beyond the present circumstances we're experiencing and in hope realize that God has something better for us. But we can also use the crisis as a stepping stone for greater ministry. You can look on the back table there, the missionary letter just came from Spain. In fact, Bree, I guess, sends that out to those that want it. Um, but our missionaries in Spain are using the crisis as a stepping stone. Listen to what uh, Sam says. He says, the long lockdown and the many restrictions we had to submit to forced us to reinvent ourselves and find new ways to do ministry. And that's what Valley is doing too. New avenues of communication were necessary and preaching via, via internet became the norm. And soon we found ourselves transcending uh, country borders. I saw myself ministering the word, not just to the people in our church here in Malaga, but to other brethren located in Madrid, Norway, England, Ireland, and the United States. At first, what we thought would be the devil's master plan to shut down the work of God became a great tool to share the gospel with members of people in many other places. This led me to prepare a series of messages using the life of Joseph. And you remember how he pictures God working in his life in chapter uh, Genesis 50, verse 20. He says, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people. So Sam has a, a good word there for us, how they reinvented themselves 
during the crisis. Now, are we looking at the present situation and saying, you know, like Peter, there's high waves and I'm going to sink? Or are we looking to Jesus and saying, Lord, help me, Lord, save me? 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, I has not seen nor the ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So if you love God, you trust him to work through all the circumstances of life. In our text here, Paul doesn't diminish the fact that there's going to be suffering and hardship in this world. In fact, that's probably the norm around the world. We're very fortunate here in this country. We almost live in a little bit of a bubble. And yet I know because of the crisis, this has been a real hardship for some people. But what Paul is doing here is he's pointing us forward to the hope that we can have in Christ and how God can work all things for good, even these situations. Now at the conclusion of my message, I'm gonna share a real tearjerker of a story. In fact, every time I've read it, I can't help but shedding a tear. But um, stick with me. Someone has said this, they said to change ourselves effectively, we have to first change our perceptions. And that's what I'm trying to do today in this message. How do you view this crisis? Change your perspective. And remember the Chinese character uh, for crisis can be broken down into, we always said danger and opportunity. Now I did Google it and I found out that it literally means danger and change point. And that's not too far removed from opportunity because that's a component of the word for opportunity in Chinese. So we, we view the circumstances, yes, they're dangerous. Yes, we could die from all of this. And yet we also view it as an opportunity. And ultimately, you know, what happens if we die? We're gonna be with Jesus anyway. That's the ultimate good that can come out of it. But we don't wanna die yet because we wanna be witnesses here. And if God has left you here, it's for that purpose. And this is what Peter tells us. So Paul's not the only one addressing this. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5.10, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Think about it. We live in a very uncertain world, but in Christ we can be restored, confirmed, strengthened, and established. Want to remain strong in the storm? Keep your eyes on Christ. Keep your focus on the finish line. Paul refers to three witnesses that'll help you. And uh, I took the time to alliterate these, and these are mine. You're not going to find these anywhere on the internet. But first is the confirming witness of creation. Second, the collaborating witness of our conscience. And third, the companion witness of the Holy Spirit. I note that three times the word groan appears in the text we just read. And so I'm going to use those as my outline as we continue here. And I want to see, first of all, the groan of creation. Now, how is creation helping us to restore our perspective? Well, it's, the, it's a confirming witness. It says here, for all creation is eagerly waiting for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. So see, there's perspective, again, keeping an, an eternal perspective. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. Against its will, we look at our world around us and, and it's, you know, it's groaning, it's a, he goes on and say, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. You see, in the beginning, God created the world perfect, didn't he? And it wasn't groaning. And, and people ask, if there's a God, why is there evil in the world? Well, there's evil in the world because God gave man the freedom of choice there in that garden. And at the opportune time, Satan tempted Adam and Eve, and they fell. And the whole creation then suffered because of their sin. There's evil in the world today because of sin. It wasn't God's original plan, but everything is suffering. 
I, I was reading this week that even the common housefly really is a picture of the world we live in today. How's that? Because, and I quote from the internet, it's a mechanical vector of pathogens, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites, some of which cause serious disease and yes, even death. And it went on to say, uh, the common housefly can carry up to a hundred different pathogens into your home. So next time you see a fly, you know, kill it. Got to be careful of those flies. They don't have a mask on. They're out there trying to, trying to destroy us too. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, uh, it was against its will. All creation was subjected, subjected to God's curse, and that included even the fly. And it groans, looking forward to God's ongoing plan of redemption because it'll one day be set free from the effects of sin. Creation has hope, so we can too. We experience the, the, the effects of sin in our world today, don't we? There's earthquakes everywhere, there's hurricanes. The National Weather Service has said we're gonna have five major ones this year. There's the viruses that we see. At Jesus' temptation, he didn't dispute Satan's claim that he is the ruler of this world. Satan is the prince and the power of this world, and he is, he is unleashing all of his evil all around us. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to that day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and de decay. That's our first point here, the confirming witness of creation. But I want you to notice, secondly, the collaborating, the collaborating witness of our bodies. As we looked at this text, there's actually three groans. The first is creation groaning. But second, notice there in verse 23 of Romans 8, and we also as believers groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. Now, as I get older, I feel the aches and pains and the groans of living in this world. There's actually kind of a humorous account in the scriptures. You probably didn't know this was there. But let me read. It says, in old age, your body no longer serves you so well. Muscles slacken, grip weakens, joints stiffen. The shades are pulled down on the world. You can't come and go as you will. Things grind to a halt. The hum of the household fades away. Hikes to the mountains are a thing of the past. Even a stroll down the road has its terrors. Your hair turns apple blossom white, adorning a fragile and impotent matchstick body. Yes, you're well on your way to eternal rest while your friends make their plans for your funeral. Life, lovely while it lasts, is soon over. Life as we know it, precious and beautiful, ends. Now you say, Pastor Steve, where is that in the Bible? That's in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 3 to 7. And I read it from the Message Bible. But you know, it's not just old age. We battle because of sin. It's depression. It's anxiety. It's addictions. It's anger. Uh, it's worry. These are witnesses to the fact that this is not how things ought to be. And what is salvation? Salvation is deliverance from all these things. Now really salvation has two parts. It's instantaneous and it's a work in progress. You see, when you trusted in Christ, you were born again. You became a new creation in Christ. But now you have to work out your salvation and uh, it means you have to subdue the things of this world. Uh, Philippians 3.20 says, who's gonna change our vile body, it doesn't happen all at once, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. Uh, salvation is instantaneous, but it's also a work in progress. We live in a world where we, where we groan. <laughs> Paul said this, he said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, this is in Philippians 3.14, and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize. Now, I read that verse for many years. In fact, I think it's one of the first verses I memorized as a child. 
But I read that verse picturing Paul as an athlete kind of straining towards the tape and running a race. But do you know when Paul wrote that? He wrote that when he was chained in prison. He was an old man. And yet, even there, he was saying, I have this perspective. I'm, I'm going to race. I'm going to go on. I'm going to win the battle for the Lord. How do we live today? How do we live in this groaning body? Well, I think the answer is over in Isaiah 40 in the Old Testament, verse 31. Even youths make faint and grow weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait on the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, keep that, mind, that phrase in mind, will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. You see, we wait patiently, keeping our perspective by staying in God's word. It tells us in our text in verse 20 that all creation was subjected in hope that it will be set free from bondage. Verse 23 tells us God promises that our bodies will one day be redeemed in hope. We wait for things to be no longer like they are. There will be injustice and riots in our streets now. Uh, there's going to be, you know, airborne killers. Uh, you know, there's going to be a daily death count in our world today because we live in a sinful, fallen world. Uh, and all these things are being reported to us through every media source. But our perspective is not CNN. Our perspective is not some YouTube video. Our perspective is God's word, isn't it? You want a picture of our world? Look at God's word. Over in Habakkuk, he tells us in chapter 1, verse 4, the law has become paralyzed and justice never prevails. Is that our world today? I'm sure it is. He says, the wicked far outnumber the righteous, so the justice has become perverted. That's the world we live in today. But Habakkuk goes on, and he gives us some of the greatest advice in all Scripture. He says, I heard and my heart pounded, over in chapter 3, verse 16, and my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet, he says, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nations invading us. Or we could say on the viruses invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fail and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. You know, things are bad in our world today, but we haven't seen the, the seasons stop yet. We haven't seen the crops not being harvested. And famine is a great motivator that someday will come upon our world. And yet Habakkuk says, I'm going to keep my perspective on God. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in the God of my Savior. You know, you can have the same attitude as Habakkuk if you stay in the Word and don't look so much at the, at the news that's blaring out of the TV in high definition. Now, biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It is not, you know, when we, we're looking for the Lord to come back and we're hoping he's coming, but that, that hope is not wishful thinking. You remember the story of the, little, the kid that didn't study a lick and he went into the classroom and one of his classmates said, are you going to pass the test? And what did he say? He says, I hope I pass. Another young lady came in the classroom and she had studied all night. She looked at every question from every perspective. And somebody said, well, how are you going to do on the test today? What did she say? She says, I hope I pass. She used the same words, but a different meaning, right? He was saying, you know, barring a miracle, I'm, I'm, or if there's a miracle, I'm going to pass. And she's saying, you know, barring some unforeseen circumstance, I'm going to pass. And that's kind of what biblical hope is. It's kind of like the second person there. It's really knowing with a confident assurance that God is working out everything according to his plan. And so Paul gives us a long session on hope here, starting in verse 24. He says, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for hope that hopes for what is already he here. But, our, but if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. 
And that's the hope we have in Christ. It's a hope that we don't see. So, our hope is a confident assurance that God is working everything out for his glory. We have seen here the confirming witness of creation. We have seen the collaborating witness of our conscience. Finally, I want you to notice the companion witness of the Holy Spirit. You know, when Jesus ascended up onto high, he sent down the Holy Spirit to live among us. And he is kind of the, as it says, the down payment. He's the earnest payment of his uh, confident fulfillment someday. Uh, the comforter, actually the word comforter means the parakletos, the, the alongside when he comes alongside us. And he will not, he's not only God's down payment, but he'll be there with us through every circumstance or trial or crisis or temptation or depression that we face. And we're looking forward in hope to a new day, but we have a companion to go with us and to help us and to show us the way. He's our resource to carry us through these days of crisis. Now, the interesting thing Paul elaborates on here and only here in the scripture in what the Holy Spirit's ministry is today with us. How many of you have been in a situation you don't know how to pray for it? Maybe that's the situation you're facing with this virus. How do I, how do I pray in, in this situation? Do I go out? Do I go to church? Do I, do I you know, send my kids out to help me? Or what should I do? And, you know, just all kinds of things that we're concerned about. Should I go to school? Should I go to work? Um, all these things. Well, the Holy Spirit, it says, prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. So while the Holy Spirit is with us, he is there praying for us, giving us direction. And he goes on to say that he always pleads for us believers in harmony with God's will. So if you don't know God's will, you just need to sit back and let the Holy Spirit pray for you. And he's always going to pray in a way that it's going to be in harmony with God's will. That's an amazing truth uh, that I see right here in the text. Now, as we're going to continue to study in, in um, Romans, I'm going to come back to this next week, uh, but we're going to see not only does the Holy Spirit pray for us, but actually Romans 8 lists two people who pray for us. The other one is, of course, Jesus. It says in Romans 8, 34 in the Brian Study Bible, who is there to condemn us for Christ Jesus, who died and more, and more than that was raised to life, he is at the right hand of God and he is interceding for us. So not only do we have the Holy Spirit with us, the second person or the third person of the Godhead praying for us, but we have the second person of the Godhead before Christ, or before God in heaven praying for us. This is what it says over in Hebrews uh, 10, 12. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So Jesus is right there at God's hand. Hebrews 9.24 says, For Christ did not enter a man-made copy of the true sanctuary, but he entered heaven itself, now to appear on our behalf in the presence of God. Why is he there? He's there on our behalf. And I can just see right now God looking down from heaven and saying, Oh, there's Steve doing something wrong. But Jesus, he comes along and he says, Now wait a minute, I died for that sin. And Jesus is there interceding on our behalf. Um, it says over in Romans 20, 7, 25, Therefore he is able to save completely those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. That's a great verse of scripture. One more promise in 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, if anyone does make a mistake, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. And we'll talk about that more next week. But here we see the Holy Spirit. When you're in a situation where you don't know how to pray, this verse tells us that He is constantly interceding for you with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. Isn't that amazing? God understands those groanings. He knows exactly what the Spirit is saying. Pastor David Frederick said, 
He will pray for what we would pray for if we really knew the mind of God. He will pray for what we would pray for if we really knew the mind of God. If you don't know how to pray, meditate in God's word and let the Holy Spirit intercede for you. Be honest with God. Say, I don't know what I should do right now, but I'm going to trust you to work it out. Now, there's really two bookends to our passage this morning, and that is the first is verse 18 where it says, We suffer now looking forward to the day when Christ will come. But verse 28 is that other verse that we often glibly quote, you know, that God is working everything for his good. But really in the context, we see that all these other things take place too that bring us to that place. There's the witness of creation. There's the witness of our conscience. And there's the witness of our comforter the companion witness of our comfort, I should say the confirming witness of creation, the collaborating witness of our conscience, and the companion witness of our comforter. Those three witnesses are there helping us to know that everything is going to work out for good in God's timing. Now, I had uh, a note from uh, Pastor Dave Nicholas, actually he's the president of Shasta Bible College, And I just thought I'd share a note from him here as we wrap things up. He says, in Ephesians 1.11, it says, God works all things after the counsel of his divine will. That's kind of similar to our verses there in Romans 28, 8.28. And then he goes on and he says, um, he says, sometimes the concept is difficult to accept, but we must remind ourselves uh, that this is an undeniable biblical truth that God is sovereign in all affairs. Nothing happens apart from his sovereign plan. And then he quotes Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them who love God, who are called according to his purpose. He has never taken by surprise the unsettling effects of COVID-19 and the subsequent requirements related to sheltering in place and social distancing have taken a tragic toll on our nation, both economically and emotionally. The mandatory shutdown of so many allegedly non-essential businesses, the suspension of corporate worship in our churches, the closure of our classrooms, and the cancellation of so many extracurricular activities, including traditional graduations, has not been easy. Then just as we are beginning to inch back towards normalcy, the image of George Floyd with his neck under the knee of Minnesota police officer Derek Chauvin was beamed into our national consciences, initiating a wave of peaceful protest mixed with Antifa-style insurrection and anarchy across the nation. Well, I think David Nicholas makes the point that, you know, we're living in crisis days. But Paul makes a point that we can live during these crisis days. Difficult months may be ahead of us even yet, and the threat of the pandemic may exist for a while, but we rest in a sovereign God, don't we, who's working all things out for his glory and for our good. Let me share a story in closing uh, that shows God's providential working. It's a story of uh, David and Svea Flood Her name is spelled S-V-E-A. They left Sweden to take the good news of Jesus to a remote place in Africa. But when they got there, after all their preparations, the local chief refused them entry into the village. So they built a mud hut nearby, and all they could do is pray. Well, no breakthroughs came. But twice a week, a little boy was allowed to come out and sell them chickens and eggs. Svea patiently told him about Jesus, the God who'd rather die than live without him, and eventually she led him to Christ. He was their only contact. Here they are, out in Africa, living there, waiting for God to work, and nothing happened. In fact, pregnant, Svea gave birth to a little girl, and then she died just a few days later. Well, that was too much for her husband David. He dug a rough grave and he buried his 27-year-old wife 
and he handed his daughter to another missionary and he said, I'm going back to Sweden. I've lost my wife. I can't take care of this baby. God has ruined my life. Now remember I said, you know, perspective is important. And this man was focusing on the temporal and the now, and he didn't see how God was working. That little girl was adopted and renamed Aggie, and she grew up in South Dakota. And in time, she married and gave birth to two children of her own. One day, she went out to her mailbox, and there was a Swedish magazine in her box. She had no idea where it came from, but a photo on the front caught her eye. It was a picture of a grave, a white cross, that bore the words, Svea Flood. She opened the magazine and read this story from long ago. It was about missionaries, the birth of the baby, the death of the young mother, and the little one African boy that she had led to Jesus. Of course, it was the story of her life. But she didn't know the rest. That little boy had grown up and built a school, and gradually he won all the students to faith in Christ in his school. Then his parents, then the chief of the village, and now there were 600 Christians in the village, all because of the witness of David and Svea Flood. But you know, that's not the end of the story. For their 25th wedding anniversary, Aggie and her husband were given a vacation to Sweden. Of course, she wanted to go there and discover her roots. There she learned that David Flood had remarried and that she had four additional stepbrothers and sisters and that her dad had given his life over to alcohol. Don't mention God, she was told. He hears God's name and, well, just don't do it. So in a rundown building, Aggie found her father, the one-time missionary, now 73 years old. He suffered from diabetes and a stroke. Cataracts blocked his vision. Aggie fell to his side crying, Papa, I'm the little girl you left behind in Africa. I'm your little girl. I never meant to give you away, whispered the broken man. I just couldn't handle things. It's all right, Papa. God took care of me. He stiffened. God forgot us all. Papa, Aggie continued gently, you didn't go to Africa in vain. Mama didn't die in vain. The little boy you brought to the Lord grew up to lead his whole village to Jesus. The one seed you planted kept growing and growing. Today there are hundreds of planted, there are hundreds of African Christians because you were faithful. Papa, Jesus loves you and he never hated you. Fortunately, tears, tears of sorrow and repentance slowed down David's face. And that day he put his life back into the loving hands of Jesus. Within a few weeks, he was gone. Years later, Aggie and her husband attended a conference in London and listened to a report from the area of Congo where she had been born. The speaker was the superintendent of the National Church representing the area where she had been, where she was born. There were now 110,000 African believers. Afterwards, Aggie approached the speaker. She had to know. She says, have you ever heard of David and Svea Flood? His eyes grew wide. He says, yes, ma'am. Svea Flood led me to Jesus when I was a young boy. She had a little girl, but I don't know what happened to her. Do you? <laughs> So in time, Aggie and her husband visited her birthplace where they were welcomed by throngs of villagers. She was escorted to her mother's grave and there Aggie knelt before that white cross and gave thanks and said, yes, God works all things for good. Now we don't understand the ways of God, but this story reminds me that in the midst of a topsy-turvy world, my hurt, my anxiety, my crisis, an all-powerful, sovereign God is working all things for good. He is active. And he cares. I think the song by Vertical Worship 
really sums it up. He says, I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. And he goes on to say, in the waiting, the same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Of course, the song is, yes, I will. And he says, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I don't know what valley you're in today, but you can trust God in this crisis. Isaiah 41 to 10 says, my counsel will stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. Amen. Well, if I can minister to you in any way, don't hesitate to call me or to call the church, call Pastor Sean. Shall we bow together in prayer? Lord, we thank you that we have these moments to look together at your word. We pray that it would speak to us about our own situation. Help us to realize you're there and you're working everything out for our good and for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.